We're all set. All right, we're up and going. Good, great. Welcome everybody to tonight's uh, City of Tumwater Planning Commission meeting for Tuesday, September 12, 2023 at 7 p.m. And our meeting is called to order. And I will do roll call. Commissioner Edwards. Here. Mr. Schumacher is excused. Vice Chair Sullivan? Yes, present. Great. Mr. Tobias? Here. Morella? Here. Here. Great. We have a quorum. Here we go. Um, are there any changes to the agenda tonight from anybody? Um, let's go to um, item four, our minutes from July 25th. Did you approve the minutes? Okay. Uh, it's been moved in the, and um, seconded to approve the minutes for July 25th, 2023. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Our minutes are approved. Thank you, everybody. Go to our commissioner's reports. Anybody have anything you'd like to talk about? Agreements? Heads shaking. All right. We'll move on. Uh, Brad, manager's report. Um, just a few things here very quickly. Uh, for your next meeting, we'll be talking about the housing element, and Laura Hodson from the State Department of Commerce will be coming in remote. She's uh, going to be giving a presentation on all the new requirements. So if you have any questions or anything on any of the materials you've read so far, um, she'd be a very good person to to answer, answer those questions. Uh, we'll also be doing a briefing on the 2023 comp plan amendments. Uh, this will be the capital facilities plan and the, um, the old Highway 99 tra transportation study. Um, some internal things just to make you aware, uh, we are continuing our research and discussions about the new wildland urban interface code and how that inter works with the urban forestry amendments. Uh, we had a meeting late August with the State Building Code Council uh, to get uh, to, to talk to them about some of the issues with it. Um, we are now having a meeting with uh, the Association of Washington Cities tomorrow to talk about their perspective on it. Um, so I'm hoping that we'll be having something going to the State Building Code Council probably for their October meeting, uh, either from the AWC as a whole or just from uh, at least from the city of Tumwater. Uh, we are also still in the pro uh, process of working on the habitat conservation plan. Uh, the, the service has provided uh, some detailed comments uh, that we need to address before we can complete a public draft. Hoping we'll have some resolution towards that by the end of the year, but there are some pretty complex things they've, they've asked us to address. So it's moving, but it's moving fairly slowly. That's probably all I've got. Um, but I guess um, just just real quickly on the, the urban wildlife interface. Any, any projected timeline for? Well, they're still holding to the October 29th adoption schedule. So um, we haven't heard differently yet. We've heard that the energy code may be delayed slightly. Uh, but until we see it, we won't we won't know what's going on. Uh, so the expectation is once they've uh, the, the the state has um, officially issued it, then we'll proceed with the urban forestry stuff again. Um, anybody else with any comments for Brad? Um, good. Um, let's go to public comment. It looks like we have Neil Jolt 
on. Uh, Mr. Tornio, would you like to address the Planning Commission? Hello, uh, this is Jerome from the JOL. Uh, yeah, don't have any comments. Thank you. Thanks for being here. All right, let's go to our eighth item, uh, our 25 comprehensive plan periodic update, land use element. Um, you'll notice, hopefully, that this packet was a lot shorter than the previous packets. Um, it was somewhat intentional. Um, what I'd like to do is, I didn't prepare a presentation for this because, to be honest, it was easier to talk from the staff report, so I apologize that I'll be doing that. Uh, but the purpose of the discussion tonight is to sort of start to delve into the whole goals, policies, and actions throughout the comprehensive plan using the land use plan as, as the initial starting discussion point. Um, I'll touch on some things that will be important to understand for as we look through all of the elements, uh, especially with these policies. And we'll also be presenting an example from the city of SeaTac of what, how they approached uh, their update, how they presented the information and the policies and so forth, which I thought was a, a good example for us to follow. Um, but first of all, I, I want to explain the structure of how we currently have our comprehensive plan laid out. Our goals are those things that are desired, income, uh, desired outcomes or intended achievements. So they're very high level. For example, in the housing element, goal H1 is to conserve and improve on existing housing stock and quality of life of neighborhoods. So a very broad goal. Under the goals are actions and policies. And policies are the higher level. And the way this is structured, so this is a policy H1-1. This is a action down here, H1.11. Um, and the policies are really intended to be very specific statements that are intended to guide action or implementation. And actions themselves are very specific things that will be undertaken by the city uh, to forward both the goal and the policy. There's a whole lot of terms that are used um, commonly throughout policies and so forth that I've outlined here. I'm not going to read through all these, but really the important thing is to understand there are things that basically from that range from shall, which is basically though you're going to do it, period, <laughs> all the way down to uh, encourage or consider, which is a very soft push in a direction of, of an action. Now, one thing that I, I found as we were going through uh, the materials from Commerce and, and the Puget Sound Regional uh, Council is that they really push the idea is if you're going to be writing goals and policies and actions, really try to make them as active as possible. So you'll notice as we go through our current policy list, and I'm the person who at the end who approved <laughs> sending this out to everybody to review, we've got a lot of very passive policies. Um, and I am more than happy to change those into much more active policies going forward. So that's rule number one. So in the continuum, they, from passive uh, to medium to passive active to active, on the passive side, you have statements of inclination. You know, conveys intent, establishes no target, or, but of no definition of success. Um, have a nice life, I guess, would be... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're not, you know, provided any goals to actually achieve that, but you've got a, a good thing to be striving for. Uh, this is where the encourage language and so forth, and sort of nebulous, expedition, expeditious and efficient infill development. Okay, what does expeditious mean? Is that a, what's the time frame for that? What is efficient? You know, is that efficient on the city's part? Is it efficient on the developer's side? All those kinds of questions. Moving up the, the scale, we get into statements of principle. And these start to introduce more clear targets or conditions of success. And the example they give here is, city shall endeavor to process completed development applications with 120 days. Now, that's the old state standard of what we had to achieve. It's, it's now shorter than that, but that's, that gives a little bit more. On the far end here, under the statements of impact, these go further, describing situations where housing is a priority. So now we take it up a notch. 
work with public and private developers to support housing for income groups under 80% AMI. It identifies who we're going to be working with. It's going to give the goal for that. What it might be missing here is a time element, but we can certainly add that as part of the implementation. So you'll see how a jurisdiction has done a more active uh, role when you take a look at the example from the city of SeaTac. Um, we'll walk through that a little bit, but their policies and actions are very much on the active side, and they've also have a very strong implementation element. So you have on one side your goals and policies that provide the overall direction of what you're going to do, and then you talk in detail about who's going to do it and when they're going to do it and how you're going to monitor it over time to make sure you're doing or what's the outcome is what you want it to be. There are some other things that have come into play uh, that sort of connect this all together, especially with the housing element update process. One of the requirements now under the state law is that we address racially disparate impacts as part of this process. And very specifically, uh, how that is played out in our goals and policies in the plan. So that means that we have to do an analysis to see, first of all, is sort of an active um, exclusionary, un, you know, unintended intent here by you know focusing resources and so forth in areas, and in, in not the areas that perhaps need it the most, but in other areas and ignoring those areas that need it the most. There's also the passive side of the policy language. There's certain things that uh, you you can add to the policy language that, well, in and of themselves don't exclude people. They are they sort of set up the conditions for doing so. Um, and that's where neighborhood character and things like that may come in. It's kind of a nebulous concept unless you really make an effort to define what that means. And in some cases, obviously, it's a very good thing because you, you're you trying to preserve something that's there that gives people a community identity and all those things, but you need to provide that level of information and detail to make sure that that's what you're doing. The other thing is that we uh, we really, under the Growth Management Act, we have to have internal consistency between the policies and goals of all the elements. So when we look at, in this case, the housing goals, we're also gonna be, have to make sure that they work with the land use because the land use element dictates where the housing is gonna occur. It needs to address the lands for public purposes because that establishes the public infrastructure, water, sewer, and so forth, stormwater too. And transportation, obviously, how do you get there and what all those kinds of things. So there's a lot of interconnectivity built into uh, this document that we'll need to understand. And so the, I, I sort of got, went into the how to evaluate policy thing. I, I, I would like to suggest taking a closer look at the, the Commerce's uh, racially uh, disparate impact guidance document, uh, especially step three of that document which I think does a very good job of, of laying out a process for thinking through and, and evaluating uh, these policies as we go forward in the process. There's a few steps, as in, there's a step one and two that we have to go through before we get to three. Uh, so we're not gonna skip, skip ahead necessarily to three, but uh, I think if you wanna have a good idea of how to think about these things as we go through this process, that's probably a good place to start. Any questions about sort of just the general policy action kind of thing? Just a quick comment that I really appreciate the effort to think about those consequences and the end. Yeah, one of the important things also is there's a lot of show your homework uh, that's required, especially as part of the housing plan element update. Um, and when I speak of the, you know, the, the, the steps one, two, and three, four, and so forth, uh, there are basically products we have to show at the end of the day to demonstrate that we did what we should do uh, as part of that process. So we're, we'll talk further about what that's going to look like and, and so forth. Um, and I also think Laura will provide a good background on how that will function and work as part of this process. But turning our attention now to the land use element, goals, policies, and actions. What I've laid out here is, uh, this is the beginning of a, our, our gap analysis, essentially. Um, 
we have our current goal and policy over here. We have all the things that this, the purpose, why we, why we wrote this in the first place. There is a, there's a purpose, fortunately, for most of these. Um, but there's a whole host of requirements that this addresses. Um, the whole coordination issue gets at, the, there's the overall growth management goal, uh, as well as other, other in, uh, parts under the RCWs and the LACs. Now, the RCWs are the things that the legislature approves um, through legislation that becomes part of our, it's the, uh, it's the, the code of Washington, essentially. So it's, it's the first, this is the first level. The WACs are the things that are developed by the state departments uh, from guidance under the WAC. So the much more detail, for example, in for SEPA, uh, the, the state legislation pats, you know, thou shalt protect the environment, and here's a couple th sentences on how to do it. And then ecology basically fleshed to that all that all that out. What does that look like? Who reports to whom? What what things are uh, are triggered, trigger SEPA, what does the process look like? All those kinds of things are covered by the wax. So that's why we have two different references here in terms of the, um, our column here. We also have evaluated really what we think the strength of, based on that chart I had um, of those goals and policies to give you an idea of at least where the staff stands and what we think uh, these are. For the most part, you'll see passive. I don't think we have any straight actives on, on here, we might have some passive slash actives, but that's yeah, about it. And then a little bit of a statement on, on where uh, some other background now. So this essentially restates what is already said in the RCW. We just put it into our own words. Under the policies, this is being consistent again addresses even more things, but we know that there are actually two different things that seem to be going on here. Number one is an important one, that the land use element is consistent with the countywide planning policies. The countywide planning policies, again, are those things that stand just under the Growth Management Act that were approved by the county, working with all the jurisdictions to basically lay out the process for developing comprehensive plans within the county. It, it specifies the large issues that need to be addressed. It establishes the rules of the game so everybody works together um, and the processes are laid out for allocating population and housing. So those are, those are pretty big things. Um, the second part of this is integrating land use consideration, uh, integrating transportation considerations into land use act decisions and vice versa. Meaning if you're gonna build a road someplace, what's the purpose in the land use side? If you are going to establish land uses, you better make sure that they have sufficient transportation to get to everything else. Uh, but those are two really kind of different things and probably don't necessarily should belong in the same policy. Under that, we have an, an action, which is to implement the 11 countywide planning uh, policy elements uh, in the countywide planning policy plan. Uh, that's like saying it's a very general action. Um, and to be really honest, everything in this plan should do that. And so once you are done with the plan, there's not really a reason for the action of it. That makes sense. So I'm not necessarily thinking it, it, it's needed. <laughs> uh, I don't want to say a feel good, <clears throat> kind of a feel good thing. So. And we also have tried to identify where we have overlap with some of these other ones. So you'll notice a few of these action items are repeated uh, throughout this. So there's a bit of tightening to do there. I think you get the general idea. The Sustainable Thurston, uh, for those of you who don't know, was an effort that the, all the jurisdictions in the early 10s, 2010s, uh, put together a gigantic laundry list of everything, uh, environmental, transportation, everything else to push even further on the idea of what can we do to uh, improve development within the county uh, to meet GMA's goals and probably go a little bit beyond that. So 
there were measurements in there that were established for uh, percent of housing located within urban areas versus rural areas. Uh, there were very, very ambitious targets established for those kinds of things. Uh, there were ambitious targets established for a whole bunch of things related to the environment that actually we've, we've achieved. Not that we've met them, but we've, in, we've incorporated them into things like the climate mitigation plans, the climate adap adaptation plans, and a lot of the other broader plans that have come afterwards. As part of the last update, we included, um, we, we explicitly included the sustainable thirst as part of that. And I'm recommending at this point that we keep doing that because I think the, all the things in it are valid. Uh, the concern with sustainable thirst and it has had far too many actions to adequately track. And so since it was <coughs> adopted in 2014, they've done one look back to see how we're doing in 2019. Um, and that took a lot of effort because there were like 90 plus actions within the plan uh, specifying, you know, we're going to do all these things. So it's kind of unwieldy, but the ideas are still, I think, valid. So as you were going through uh, the staff report and so forth, any of the policies and, and goals and so forth, were there any questions that you had based on what you're reading or any thoughts or things that we weren't talking about that we maybe should be considering as part of this. What I would say, not seeing anybody else, but, um, in, in general, what I'm hoping we can get to is um, clearer, plain language statements about why it matters, why any particular policy matters, what our goal is, why that, what we're trying to achieve, and why an action is going to, we think, is going to get us there. Um, so, you know, realize that sometimes, but, you know, kind of laying out, I'll confess, I didn't go look at all the RCWs in West. Um, so, um, I have a general idea of what some of them um, are about, but, you know, kind of why it matters to us and our community. I think this would be included in the goal policy in the goals and policies aspect of it. Um, but does the the land use element speak to emergency and disaster preparedness as far as uh, what happens if you know we, we set aside certain land for um, you know con say conservation purposes or for um, yeah, any any sort of zoning and then say a catastrophic flood occurs and puts it all underwater or a wildfire estimates uh, an urban forest that we had set aside. Um, you know, does, does the land use policy speak to how to adapt when, uh, if a disaster strikes a certain area, of how we sort of pivot as a, a city handle situations like that? Is there... Yeah, I think there, there are two parts to that. It, I, the land use element does establish um, goals and policies of areas to avoid, uh, like, in the, like the number one, the flood example. Uh, fortunately, there are flood maps that we have a very good idea of what parts of the city are more prone than others. Uh, less density, less you know, we don't put we don't build in those areas if we if, if we can avoid it. So that side is is taken care of. But I think you've hit on a, a good thing. Whether you're talking about wildfire or earthquakes, there are things that we can identify. Say for an earthquake, where we we're looking at soil types and you should build on a peat bog, for example. Like to do well in an earthquake, um, those kinds of things. However, we don't know necessarily where all the faults are, uh, as we keep discovering them every time we have an earthquake. Oh, we didn't know about that one. Uh, or wildfires, to be honest, there are things, you know, there are areas that we can identify that might be at higher risk, perhaps, but it's a whole combination of what did that year's, you know, lack of rain look like? What did the vegetation look like? What are the winds at that time? All those kinds of things play into that part. So 
I think on that side, we have a much more general direction on the policy and the goal side of things about how to address them. You know, I'm, there are policies in there that say build, build appropriately, strengthen buildings for earthquakes and things like that. Or in the case of the, the new guidance from the, 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 the state, uh, adopt uh, wildland urban interface codes in order to deal with you know, the threats that you have from wildfires in urban areas. So it, I think it depends. We can make some choices on the land use side and within the land use plan that are, are fairly easy. Landslide areas or you know, places that flood and then areas that we're just going to have to take a calculated risk. So again, this first chapter, I mean, first set of policies really deal with how the land use element works with everything else in the, in the comprehensive plan. Um, it brings up, we have a neighborhood appendix uh, with, an, with an, an intent to engage in planning on a neighborhood level. Uh, it calls out the desire for a new community center, which was the, the town center plan back in the early 2000s. Uh, it establishes things that we need to do to coordinate with other plans, such as the Port of Olympia master plan, and so forth. In addition, also touches on the historic district master plan. So it's a, sort of like the catch-all for every other thing that we need to tie into set of policies and goals. The second land use goal, scrolling all the way down, deals with the, the GMA goals for compact development meaning that you know, we don't want to have uh, sprawl that uses up a lot of land for a little density worth of uses. So the focus here is really to make sure that any development that occurs, uh, occurs in an orderly fashion and it occurs in a cost-effective fashion. Uh, and this is where we start to have the tie-in to the capital facilities element uh, as part of the, the land use element. Uh, because this is basically, um, Calls out all the good reasons to uh, be efficient with land. We don't have to worry about this as much within the city, but the county has to worry about protecting natural resources, whether mineral lands or forest lands or ag lands. We do have one forest land, and we do have uh, a, a mine, a mineral mine in the city. So we have to pay special attention to protections for those. Uh, but this is also making sure we protect critical areas in appropriate fashion. We have a number of places where we talk about um, innovative land management techniques. And the point I'd like to make with this is there's a lot of good ideas that remain good ideas. Um, that we keep discovering every generation, <laughs> if you're a planner, uh, meaning that uh, cluster housing, uh, planning to development, things like our transfer of development rights, things that you can do uh, to preserve land in one place while developing in another, trade-offs that you do in that regard are probably a good thing to be considering. Um, this is an area I think we're going to explore a little bit further because this is number one area that we start to see the interaction between the comprehensive plan and our development code. So there are a lot of things, you know, we're setting, what we're doing in the comprehensive plan is sort of setting the broad outline structure for the direction we want our development code to go in. So you'll notice a lot of these things we've talked about in this policy, uh, LU 2.3, uh, zero lot line developments, finding the developments, transfer development rights, and so forth, are all things that are reflected in Title 18 of the Zoning Code um, as special cases. However, I think this action item is something we never, I think we need to go to the next level. We need to think about a more proactive um, thing of measuring whether or not these things are actually working and going back and tweaking them as needed uh, to make sure they're doing what we want them to do. This section also covers um, annexations, uh, development standards, design standards, excuse me. Um, 
it's a kind of a mishmash, to be honest. But there's some very important things in there. Goal three deals with adequate public services. Uh, and this is where we specifically get into the tie into the capital facilities plan, meaning that we're going to have these land uses in these areas. Are we going to make sure that we ensure that there's adequate water and sewer? And by that, in the city, it means that it's public water and public sewer, not uh, on septic systems, for example, and that the roadway systems are in urban uh, appropriate shape. So there's a lot of specific ties into like the water system plan and the sound and sanitary sewer plan. Um, anytime we do development, we, should, we need to analyze its impact on these services, make sure that we're providing the services that needed. And again, this is also ties back into the, the desire to um, prevent sprawl by making sure that adequate facilities to settled areas first rather than send a water line or a road out to a distant area first. Pardon me. That idea, does that, um, does this, um, does D um, services availability encompass that notion of efficient provision of those services? Then? Yeah, and that ties back into the Growth Management Act requirement that, that if you are, you know, if you're going to allow for new growth, make sure that you allow for the necessary services for it. Okay. Exactly. Goals one and two of the GMA. There's also some explicit uh, statements about residential commercial or development utilizing, utilizing septic tanks to hook up eventually to sewer if, this, if that fails or if it becomes readily available. So there's, a, there's built in understanding that at some point things are going to transition out of the, you know, the, the condition it was when it was first built into the next phase for all the good reasons of protecting water supply and, and all of that. And if there's a tie back there to also to lot and so forth. Same thing with the water side of this. In the land use goal four, we tie back into the housing element, um, meaning that this is where encouraging land use patterns that support affordable housing. Um, I think we're going to be doing a lot of discussions about this uh, because we're give you a little bit of background. I, we talked a little bit about this, but uh, the state has allocated um, housing to um, different uh, AMI across the spectrum on the countywide level. So I, I, I lost track, but I think it's 30,000 new units over the next 20 years on the countywide level. And those are broken out by under 30% AMI, under 50, under 80, under 100, and so forth. The bulk of the new housing that we're going to need to figure out how to address is going to be the under 80%. Currently, we provide between 80 and 120 pretty well. That's our target. We're not as worried about the over 220, and the state law doesn't require us to even address it. But we need to find a way to address the under. Um, and I think what the, what's important about that is that the more efficient way, perhaps, to consider providing housing at that level is to increase density, meaning apartment buildings versus single family housing, that kind of thing. So I have a feeling we'll be taking a closer look at our comprehensive land use map and our zoning map to identify those areas where potentially we could upzone, essentially, for higher densities. Because the way our map is currently set up, we handle the 100% and more very well through our single family zones. But we don't necessarily address the, the other side as well. How that's actually going to work out and what other things we can do to, in addition to that, uh, that will be a, definitely a big topic for discussion. Um, I would suggest that would be a very good question to ask Laura at the next meeting about what are other jurisdictions doing and what are the things that we should be thinking about in addition to that, how to address these particular state mandates. So it's interesting, we do have a number of policies within here that are 
you know, support what we're going to have to do anyway, meaning that encouraging innovative techniques for providing affordable housing, uh, tying that into sort of the design standards so we have an attractive product. That's a couple things, couple parts of that. Number one is aesthetics. Number two is increasing density in existing low-density areas. How do you make that work with the neighbors to, as much as you can? Um, you know, are there ways to reduce the appearance of the structures? Is there a way, you know, all those kinds of things. So, well, it won't take care of every issue. It'll help, <laughs> sort of the, how it all works together. Um, it also uh, addresses manufactured housing in here because the state law has made it, um, we have to uh, allow for manufactured homes in all of our residential zones. So there's some state mandates already as part of this. And in fact, back to the discussion of encouraging higher density residential uses and afford provide affordable housing, uh, we already have <laughs> that policy. And it says these uses should be blended with the existing character of the community. So it shouldn't be a terrible shock that we, uh, we're still pursuing that, but we're actually going to think of other ways to do that. Um, again, focusing housing types of densities and corridors where there's transportation, meaning there's transit access or other things like that. That is just a question. I didn't really see it jump out at me. Is this the section where we could, where there would be either policies around or actions to implement policies using publicly funded or subsidized support? I think there's an opportunity for that, but I think that's primarily going to be in the housing element, sort of how, because that's a very specific um, housing type that we do address in the housing element and policies and so forth. Not so necessarily as a different land use type. You know, I, in my mind, I'm thinking on the land, when we talk about land use and housing, I'm thinking about how intense is the use, how dense it is versus how, and so forth, or, how near it is to services, commercial jobs, all those kinds of things. When we get into, and not necessarily the ownership model, but you know, the ownership model essentially, that's more of a housing element thing. I guess I was thinking maybe if we land parcels or areas that the maybe at, in some by some way the the city could acquire. And um, and then declare that this is going to be used for, mm -hmm. and then, you know, whatever whatever other process to construct it or to back up on, but you know, setting aside the, those chunks, I can purchase the development rights or yeah. There, there's a couple parts to that. There's and this comes up a lot, and especially came up a lot when we were developing the housing action plan. Number one, using existing city lands for affordable housing or gophers or whatever else we need at the moment. Um, Tim water supply of extra land is pretty limited. We don't have a lot that we can consider that way. However, we have in the recent past as part of our affordable housing um, discussions um, used um, like um, various sorts of grant funds to support the purchase of small plots of land that may have, you know, one or two small houses that need to be renovated. We'll buy the land and the uh, nonprofits within the community will, will purchase uh, the house and renovate the house and turn it around as affordable housing. So we have done that on a very small level. The issue is that that's a pretty expensive thing for us to do. Uh, so if we, our next really big opportunity to sort of help that process is probably the washtop property on Capitol. Uh, that's 10 acres of land right in the middle of everything. Uh, there's a lot of challenges, obviously, to taking a site that's been transportation-related for 80-plus years and converting it into something healthy. Uh, but at the same time, it has a great opportunity. It's in the middle of everything transportation-wise. It's, you know, you could do commercial to offset some of the residential costs there, all those kinds of things to make it. So the city is definitely 
playing an active role with that. We are we we have a uh, we're seeking grant funding for the the cleanup right now as a partner to sort of set that up for further the next step. So I think in those cases where it makes sense, that's something we will definitely pursue. I think on the brewery side, for example, we're we're where you we've gotten a grant for uh, brownfield cleanup of the site, which is sort of like the first level. <laughs> Identify what needs to be done. Number F. Cross the street. Yeah. The one thing about planning, <laughs> you don't really have to rush out the door that way. Um, All right. Well, that, and, and, you know, I just want to mention that in case that fits in somewhere here. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, Terry, before I get to the, it, we, you know, it, but very quickly, it's something we will have to consider doing more of, period, uh, as or at least identify as a potential path of something we have to do. You know, is, is considerable, but you know, if we're serious about accomplishing things, we really ought to devote that. Well, I think the housing element being set up. Can't get there without going through the mm -hmm. get into housing on increasing density. Two piece of increasing density transit. Where where do we fit in here? Maybe a desire for the city to create public transit. public transit to, to densify uh, housing. I, I think we, we we're definitely going to have uh, inner city transit will be visiting with us in the next few months to have more discussions about that. Terry, you've been here for the few times they've come and we've chatted about this. We're always in a chicken and an egg situation. We don't have enough density to get the transit. Um, we have enough density, where's the transit? Um, so I think you're, you're, I know you're getting dab of money. Mm -hmm. I wonder if maybe there isn't a possibility of hiring a uh, study on moving uh, mm -hmm. uh, obviously inner city transit does these studies, but studies have a Led to anything, you know, running buses uh, way up above Martin Way, in Hawks Prairie, but they're not coming down here. They they seem to have their their eyes focused on different. But the important part is that area of Lacey has it's a very recent development in terms of getting the number of houses out there and everything else and businesses and everything else. And I think what we're seeing, especially in the next few years, is the area southeast and of the airport and down Little Rock, we're getting to that point where we're gonna have the housing and the, the, the capacity that, that could drive uh, <coughs> transit use in those corridors beyond what is being provided now. So I think we're, we're hitting the necessary conditions in those areas to look at an expansion. So I think what, it, your, your idea is a good one in terms of, I think it's a, it's a good idea for uh, if we are consultant for the transportation plan to take a look at as part of everything else they have to take a look at, but just sort of what are the, how do we present this in the most efficient way to the inner city and say, this is the time we're ready to go, or is it a lobbying effort or, or what do we need to do? To is there something within the land use plan I think we can do it both with both. I think number one, we have, we have we can demonstrate the existing current growth. We can definitely support it by having higher densities in those areas and the housing types that would be most likely to support that. So I think that's all part of that conversation. So actually, that's a good transition because the next goal deals with transportation. Um, 
and encouraging efficient multimodal transportation systems in coordination with regional, city, and county, and the state, of course, since we have I-5 going through the middle. So the other thing we'll need to take a look at is the, the regional Thurston Regional Transportation Plan, because that sort of also ties us into the larger system within the county. We also have some strange add-ins. Uh, the Parks and Rec Plan uh, coordination is really to deal with uh, trails in this particular case. We don't make it explicit, but we probably should get explicit in the future. Uh, da -da -da -da. Oh. Encouraging the development of access to transit stops as part of the development conditions. This is something that's sort of evolved over time. You'll notice there are a couple of curb cuts. I mean, our, our curb bulb outs on Israel that were intended for transit. Uh, they're not used for transit because buses don't necessarily like to leave the flow of traffic and then try to figure out how to get back in. Uh, but that was an example of supporting the transit side. But I think there are other things. We don't have to get to that level of specificity in the plan uh, to look for opportunities for that. Also, the important is going back to Terry's point, the densities drive the drive transit too. So we need to be looking at that part of this effort. Yeah. Reinforce the link between land use and public transportation by encouraging development to occur at res urban residential densities along transit corridors, nodes, et cetera. You'll notice there are like 4,000 uh, policies under the transportation. I, Elizabeth, I had played a large role in that. Uh, she wrote, <laughs> wrote that section. Um, go ahead, Terry. Are we looking to extend, have more actions here? We've got a, a whole two pages of policies here. Right. I think what we're looking for, number one, is to shrink the number of policies. <laughs> and number two, focus a lot on the implementation side. So I think what I'd like to do is sort of move more, a little more quickly and we'll get to the CTAC example, because I think that that's a good one for you to think about, about how this might lay out in the future. Uh, talking a little bit about, um, getting back to Michael's question, uh, reducing impacts from flooding, uh, stormwater management, and so forth are all built into land use policies as well. And as is obviously retention of open space for parks and trails and recreation opportunities. Uh, again, Michael, this is another one. The land use aid is encourage, uh, ensure physical limitations of land are observed during the development process. Uh, so we don't essentially create problems uh, by allowing development. This is where the connection to the hazard mitigation plan comes in. Talk about, I think we have uh, some connections in there. Mm -hmm. okay. Development in residential areas, very specific <laughs> thing. Industrial and commercial area levels of development. That's primarily to make sure that there are appropriate buffers between intensities of uses and, you know, smells, odors, the traditional zoning. Uh, we do have a few policies that deal with energy efficiency, primarily through our building code and other policies. I think we should take a closer look at this and determine whether or not this might necessarily belong more in our climate element rather than the land use element, since we're developing that as well. We have historic preservation, and then finally, we recognize the fact there's this airport in the town and we have to probably structure development in an appropriate way around an airport. That's also a, a requirement from state law. I'm gonna quickly go to the example. Hopefully, excuse me. So this is the land use element from the city of SeaTac, and they completed their update about a couple years ago on 35, so a little bit more 
within the past five years. But their structure of each of their elements is kind of unique, and I kind of like it. This is only 38 pages in length, and this focuses almost entirely on the goals and policies and how you implement them, period. Uh, all the technical discussion is somewhere else. All the capacity analysis, all of those things are in, in a different section. Uh, but their layout is also, I, th I think, pretty good. Um, they focus, first of all, on, on the things that we have to discuss as part of growth management. So urban centers, meaning that like the town center, in our case, Capitol Boulevard, Corridor, Brewery District, Little Rock, those are our urban centers within the city. And it talks and it establishes policies around the, the general growth of the city. It then goes into healthy, equitable, and connected communities. And this is where it draws in the connections to the transportation element. Uh, they, have an out, they have a discussion of healthy foods, housing, access to housing, access to neighborhood services. That could be everything from health services to parks and recreation and so forth. And then it discusses the citywide land uses on a broad scale, um, residential, commercial, industrial, plus public facilities that serve those and so forth. And then they devote about a third of the chapter to implementation. So, you know, we, we have a good discussion here. So this is their structure. Focusing growth to achieve a balanced mix and arrangement of land use to support economic vitality, community health and equity, and transit access. Terry, I think you'd like this one. Then their policies get very, very uh, detailed. Uh, implement the city center South 151st Street station area, Angle Lake Station. This is all the link rail things, but it's very specific, very, very much tied in. Uh, view and potentially amend the city center plan in the near future. That's really dependent upon, obviously, there are other things. So we we do have an airport, but we don't have this size of an airport yet. So, Thank God. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'd just like to point out, this was my I, my first professional job was with the city of SeaTac. Um, and at the time, there were 600 houses uh, under the third runway, where that is now. So things change over time. They're not there anymore. Um, but as you see, they they do a lot of things to sort of tie in um, how to get to nodes and transit and access explicitly in the plan. And I think that's probably a good thing for us to consider. Their healthy goals and equity, they, these little boxes sort of provide additional of direction. So for more information on trans, uh, you know, good multimodal access things, look at our transportation element, so forth. Uh, but again, I really you know, recommend that you take a look at their policy language um, because I, I kind of, I like how it, it, it makes you feel good. Not only makes you feel good, but makes you want to do something. So maybe that's, that's our new criteria for planning. Let me just go down to the implementation. Tables. So, they lay out some very explicit instructions for what, um, how to assign zoning uh, or land uses, excuse me, in this case. Um, um, they have, uh, first of all, in the city of Tumwater, we have uh, Comprehensive plan designations that are almost the same as our zoning. So if we have a single family low town plan designation, our single family low zoning, there's no, it's just a one to one. In a lot of other jurisdictions on the comprehensive plan level, there is a broad category. So single family is the traditional or multifamily. So in their case, they have residential low density, and then they have what are known as implementing zone districts of various sizes. So, for example, if we did that in the city of Tumwater, which in my mind, I think makes sense, um, we have a single family zone, which would have the RSR, the single family low and the single family medium of all those things. The advantage with having a, a 
not a one-to-one -one system, but a one-to-three system, it's a lot more flexible and allows for change to occur a lot faster if markets change, if development opportunities occur, those kinds of things. As it stands now, if you want to rezone a property, leave an upzone from single family low to single family medium, you have to do a comprehensive plan change and the zoning change together. And as you're probably aware, that's a year long process to do that. So that's not a very efficient way to consider that. So we'll talk a little bit about more about whether that's appropriate here or not, but just keep in mind that's a good, it's a good thing uh, if we're really, if we were looking for opportunities to encourage say more affordable housing, being more flexible in how we structure our land use designations and zones is, is probably one important way to consider that. What it also allows for is a lot more flexibility uh, in switching up what those zones are or expanding what those zones could be. Uh, so if we have instances where we think in this neighborhood, it's a special case, it's got either water access or it's got something else that we want to emphasize, but traditional one-stop zone doesn't really do it. This gives us an ability to, to build something without building a whole apartment building. We can build a house instead, if that makes sense. Take as much work. This is more, excuse me, I'm trying to scroll. Here we go. So this is their implementation table. So each of the policies, so we start with their overall goal focus growth and achieving a balanced mix and arrangement of land uses. And our, we have our policies, we have our various implementation strategies, it has who's going to do it, and the time frame. There are some things that are going to be ongoing. You know, we're, you know, manage and track your comprehensive plan, that's an ongoing thing, or every 10-year cycle kind of thing. There are some things that are more short-term goals such as, in this case, incentivize multi, uh, multifamily residential projects in the urban center through density bonuses, tax credits, and so forth. Those are things that probably a one-off ordinance would take care of, and it's a matter of just deciding that which order we want to hit first, those kinds of things. So the important thing is, in a lot of these cases, these policies, there are multiple ways to get at the policies. And, it's, and this spells out the process for doing that and allows not only the planning commission, but also the council and the general public to say, okay, this is a great goal. How are we going to do it? Well, this is our roadmap for doing it. And then we can make adjustments to the roadmap as we need to. So I, I commend, or at least recommend that you take a, a good look at this as an example. This is something I think would work very well for us in terms of we're not going to be doing a light rail system in the next five years, seven or eight years maybe, but um, we have licensing agreements with the Gophers to run it, but we're going to sort it out. Um, so any, any questions on the example uh, from CTAC or any, any good parts, negative, you know, things that you liked or didn't like about it? One of the things I find really striking, the comprehensive plan on uh, page 160 in the packet, uh, yeah, LU12 on the, um, uh, but you, you look at the zoning map of everything, and one of the things that strikes me, which you know, anyone who's been to the airport can, can attest to, is that the, the development is very much on this like very uh, narrow, cor well, relatively narrow corridor that is international way. So that's where like all of everything is sort of concentrated, because once you get you know, a couple blocks over to the east of there, it's pretty much all single family or like residential low density, a few high density spaces. Um, but you can see like any, any sort of development, it seems like it's going to happen sort of in that corridor still. Maybe with some of these adjoining areas, the regional business mix, it seems like that might be, is that sort of like where they're kind of pinpointing around the Angle Lake station to sort of activate that space? Um, you can kind of see they've got that going. But then the Tuckwilla International Boulevard Station that's at the north end has some 
commercial high density. I believe it was like a McDonald's, a, you know, a, a gas station, a couple things like that. But then the rest is just solidly low res low density residential um, all the way up. So uh, I think it's interesting to see how um, obviously Angle Lake Station is still fairly new. I mean, they they projected it for 2016, but I don't think it opened until 2018, maybe. Mm -hmm. And then. Uh, so I, I can definitely see the positive difference that makes. Like once you have a transportation yeah. hub there, mm -hmm. you could say, okay, you know, people could, you know, park their car here, take the light rail up to Seattle, come back, and then you may get a destination spot or a commuter spot. Um, so I, I could definitely see like the way that they're going to act, they could activate the space down here. I haven't been to that uh, area recently, so I don't know if like what's actually gotten in there yet, but. Um, that does look promising, but then as far as, you know, north of uh, Highway 518, um, looks like there might not be as much opportunity for um, that same level of, of regional business or um, dense neighborhoods. So the folks that are living in the residential low density at the north end of SeaTac are probably going to be uh, a bit further out, further removed from whatever development happens in the south end. Yeah. The, the important thing is both north and south of the airport, those uh, most part have been bought out. Yeah. There are former single family neighborhoods that developed under the county that have been since bought out by the port. So uh, International Boulevard sort of the dividing line of everything airport and then city uh, now for the most part. There are, a f the interesting thing is uh, again, SeaTac didn't become a city until 1995. Uh, so what they, they, it was like a county developed area uh, and lower density for the most part. There are some commercial nodes along Military Road on the, on the east side of the city, but they're fairly small. So, um, but they, they have a little bit more than say what we have with the frog market or whatever up in uh, Olympia or, or things like that. Uh, but they have the opportunity for other kinds of nodes. One of the things that they're, I, I, we talked with their planning director at the planning director's conference uh, last week, they're definitely struggling with how they're going to address the affordable housing component uh, because of their land use pattern. Uh, they've got the, uh, you know, everything along International Boulevard. There's not a lot of residential, more multifamily along that area. And then it's single family. Uh, and where and how they're going to accommodate some of that stuff is, is they're having some battles. Because it's not an easy thing. You've got an existing land use pattern that's been there for 50 years plus, and how do you change that? Are there height restrictions on? Because uh, I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised at how low density SeaTac is. I mean, for the fact it's you know right in the Seattle metro area, it's got a, a light, uh, multiple light link stations. Now you would think that this would be prime space to you know really like activate some. Uh, Multifamily medium, multifamily high, or mixed-use residential um, spaces, but uh, yeah, see like how uh, low dense, how low density it is is kind of surprising. Uh, one thing I find interesting though is, are there height restrictions because it is next to an airport? As far as or, or uh, would you know, is it unlikely that anything residential would cause a, a height barrier or issue with the airport. Yeah, no, actually, I mean, with the hotels and so forth, they, they have some pretty tall buildings along International Boulevard. Uh, the, the areas that they're primarily concerned with are the north and the south areas, and that, those are, you know, there, there's no development now in those areas. The other important underlying factor is the city council comes from those single-family neighborhoods for the most part. So there's a less of a desire to see change uh, from those people how that works out is they, they, they had some good battles about how big, uh, like the Angle Lake Station area, the redevelopment area would be and so forth. And it's it's not just SeaTac. I mean, C uh, Seattle has had all those battles uh, when they did light, uh, light rail through the U District and Roosevelt and all that, you know, trying to keep it somewhat compact, not affecting the neighborhoods outside of it. So. One of the things that strikes me about um, particularly seeing the map and everything, their, their uh, plan is going to focus on their jurisdiction, but of course they're not isolated. They have, they are entirely surrounded by other jurisdictions that are highly developed. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to take, and we are too, for a lot. 
So I mean, you have to you have to take that into context and think about you know we can't provide for, for us for the city of Tumwater if we can't provide everything. You know, what are the other jurisdictions who are adjacent to us able to do? Um, so I think that's just a very important consideration. It's why the whole regional. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't think it would be notwithstanding have told us that could change. Um, it is, you know, maybe it's not reasonable to do everything. We've tried that discussion. Yeah. <laughs> By the time all is said, that could be changed. But one. Of, but one of the important things I've heard from uh, staff at the state level is that well. The state has has a vision for what the cities will do. It's not necessarily on the cities to make those visions come true. It's on us really to allow for those visions potentially to come true, meaning that we don't put up barriers to it. If the market goes in that direction, if there's a builder who wants to do it, it's there. But we're not necessarily we we we're not developers uh, city side, so we're not going to be doing that or we're not going or more importantly a more focused thing we provide money for some affordable housing projects but we we certainly don't fund or build even one affordable housing project we just support and help so i think that's more how we have to think about this um not necessarily saying we're going to we have to we have to you know lay out here the things that need to happen and identify those barriers that exist Especially on the, if you're going to provide lower income housing, there's funding issues. Who's going to provide the services, not only for the housing, but for the ongoing wraparound services and all that? Um, it's okay to acknowledge that that's not, we can't solve that, but here's the path that we you know, work to address those things. Can I have a question um, from? Off track where it was, but does the does the CTAC plan tie their commercial or industrial zone to transit use? Thinking jobs. Yeah, it, it they do because of just the fact that most of it's along the corridor. So there are some rather large warehouses that are almost under the flight path, but are within a walkable distance of both the the, the bus service that runs down in National Boulevard and the Link North Station. So. They, they they link the, they connect the dots between that and it's not just a density of housing kind of a thing residential. No, they, you're right. They they really focus on the employment side and the fact that and we can do that too because we're looking at our employment is like 27,000, almost the same as our population. Uh, and it is con there are hot spots. If you go onto the TRPC website, you can look at. Where the hotspots of employment are, and, are, and to nobody's surprised it's uh, on either side of us the state offices. But um, you know that at least gives us a concentration of where we should be focusing more more things. I'm I'm done. So if you have any other questions, so page uh, 162 of the packet makes note of the residential high mixed use and commercial high designations uh, forming the core of um, CTAC's urban center. Um, and the core, you know, if you look, I had to look pretty closely. It's right next to Angle Lake Station, but it's a relatively small area. That's like a core. It's um, a very and it's a very physically restricted area. I mean the. The, the main road, maybe a lot depth, and then lake, and it's also a, a hillside. So there, there's other things that aren't. You can't you can't expand north from there because then you hit Alaska Airlines uh, corporate office. You can't really expand south uh, because you you hit the uh, uh, barrier of the well, not the city itself, but uh, it just seems it seems interesting that it, it, on the one hand you have uh, the example set by mixed use like commercial residential. Um, as like a, a model for it, but there's only like really one section. I mean, there's this other area next to Bow Lake, um, slightly bigger, but I don't know if how developed that is yet. And then like 
little splotches of brown next to uh, Sequoia Boulevard Station. So uh, it, as far as like, if the, as far as, you know, you said CTAC wants to uh, address the low income housing address like more housing options, but again, there's, it, it's pretty limited to see where they're actually allowing the, um, probably one of the most, uh, you know, one of the useful tools in our tool, our residential planning tool belt, as far as um, creating options that activate a space both commercially and provide housing for um, uh, greater density than you would from a single family uh, low density. So is there any, any uh, discussion or desire on their part to expand those areas or is it kind of running the same it's probably pretty limited, and this this came about before a lot of the state legislation came about on the housing side, and also some of the stuff that happened this year. Uh, so it, it would be interesting to see what they do uh, to address some of those things. But we just. This plan was before the most recent. Uh, the bulk of the work was definitely before the most recent stuff. That's that's an important thing to do. So more, this is an example more of an active plan, and a, you know, a much I hope a much more usable format plan. Less so on they they have all the right ideas. Uh, we um, I was asking Laura today about what kind of example she has about on the housing specifically that like the central Puget Sound cities are doing. Uh, there are, it's very limited so far, there's not much. So she's gonna be bringing a couple examples from Renton, uh, but it's literally like the first draft of where they are in the process. So I think we're gonna be learning at the same time we do all this, should be interesting. <laughs> but Erica says she's willing to learn and also to uh, complete this within the allotted time frame. So she's writing that down. I need mm -hmm. to find another job tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Talked about uh, Lacey, um, then Lacey put um, some more and spill lines all the way up there. Well, again, it, it was done by some very large developments that occurred, so it was primarily private driven, private development driven. Uh, but Lacey provided the framework for that in terms of this is an area we anticipate to be developing and how it will develop. So the larger structure was there. So when the, when the uh, like Patriots Landing and other things, those large developments came in, they were going into an existing framework where they would provide, obviously, they had the, a larger development can provide the, the necessary infrastructure, much easier than, say, a bunch of short flats. Does wastewater primarily flow to lot, or do we have wastewater treatment plants in the city itself? We, it all goes to lot downtown. Uh, they had uh, considered some, uh, I don't want to say, some level of treatment on some property along the Deschutes, um, but I, they've been moving away from that as a model. Originally, like Lacey has some things like that um, near the office parks and the industrial development there, uh, but my most recent discussions with lot as they've been moving away from that and just focusing on keeping everything downtown. Brad, I'm wondering as you know, particularly as we um, delve more into the land use, but maybe other maybe other elements too, but land use um, maps and, and 
visual. Really, if there are places that will be somehow in transition, maybe there's mm -hmm. not a lot of, you know, as we work out, you know, you know, in this this area of the city or that area of the city. Uh, here's where we are now, but it's probably going to be. I, I do think those kinds of exercises are good. If it makes you uh, feel better, the planning director's conference last week in Chelan, we, we did an exercise involving Legos, yeah. larger aerial maps. Um, so it, it's, it's, we like playing with Legos for density and various other things. Um, but yeah, no, I think that's a, it's a great way to sort of get a, a better picture of what these changes could look like on the ground. What are the connections are? You know, I mean, um, all the materials are public, so people can, if they, mm -hmm. if they choose to go meeting, so eventually. Sure. Measured by a well second. Moved and seconded. Um, call for discussion. Um, all in favor of adjourning tonight, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. We are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, guys. I started my list for Laura. Okay.